This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Berkeley, publisher of Carol Stiver's debut novel, The Mother Code. James Rollins raves, Some stories are so unique, yet so universal, that it is a wonder they aren't a part of the human fable already. Carol Stiver's The Mother Code is such a novel. Learn more over at prh.com slash themothercode. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 430 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Katie Mack. She's an assistant professor of physics at North Carolina State University, where she's also a member of the Leadership and Public Science Cluster. She's written for a number of popular publications, such as Sky and Telescope, Time, and Scientific American, and you can follow her on Twitter at AstroKatie. And we'll be speaking with her today about her first book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, which explores various scenarios for the end of the universe. And today's show is brought to you by The Mother Code, the debut novel by Carol Stivers. And here's a description of the book. It says, The year is 2049. When a deadly biowarfare agent spreads out of control, scientists must scramble to ensure the survival of the human race by placing genetically engineered children inside large-scale robots to be incubated, birthed, and raised by machines. Kai is born in America's desert southwest, his only companion his robotic mother, Rosie. But as children like Kai come of age, their mothers transform too, in ways that were never predicted. And when government survivors decide that the mothers must be destroyed, Kai is faced with a choice. Will he fight to save the only parent he's ever known? Karen Joy Fowler writes, Stiver's wonderful story settles right on the line between human and machine, as blame and threat and rescue and love shift from character to character in surprising and powerful ways. And Shannon McGuire calls the book brilliant, innovative, and moving. So again, the book is called The Mother Code by Carol Stivers, and you can learn more over at prh.com slash themothercode. All right, so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Katie Mack. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, so your new book contains quotes from science fiction authors such as Alistair Reynolds and Anne Leckie. So I take it you're a pretty big science fiction fan? Yes. Uh, my my reading of books is almost entirely books about spaceships, or yeah. if not that, uh, science fiction in general. So that's... Um, that's that's where I find my escape from reality, which is which is often very necessary. Yeah, well, it's nice because um, you know I interview a lot of people, and a lot of people who aren't in science fiction professionally, you know, they they might be science fiction fans, but they've read sort of the same seven or eight authors, you know, Asimov, mm -hmm. Clark, yeah. and so on. And so when I hear someone say, "Oh, they they've read Alistair Reynolds or Analecki," I'm like, "Oh, here's a a really serious <laughs> science fiction fan." Yeah, I mean, I I don't know I don't know how serious I am exactly, but um, I I've I try to keep up more with kind of contemporary authors than with the so so called classics, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, how did you get into reading science fiction? Um, I've always been interested in it. My my mom has always been a big science fiction fan. So when I was a kid, I used to um, I used to steal her her copies of analog and Asimov magazines and, uh, and read as much as I could of, in those. And just, uh, since then I've, I've always found those kinds of books and stories the most interesting. Mm -hmm. So were you into, did your, did reading science fiction get you interested in science or did those things develop in parallel? Or? Um, I think, I think that it was a little of both, but uh, I was always interested in science and kind of how things work and, you know, the big questions of reality. But so I think that I think there was some feedback between the two things. Science fiction introduced me to some of those topics and kind of reading popular science things did, too. So it was really a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, with those, uh, you know, a lot of people also, even if they're science fiction fans, even if they read a lot of novels, don't necessarily read short stories. And I'm mm -hmm. actually mostly interested in in short or most interested in short stories. And I also, you know, I read, I grew up reading Asimov's and Analog and so on. So mm -hmm. that's cool that you you read uh, short fiction in addition to novels. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's just so much great stuff out there, you know. And with with things like Asimov and Analog, you you never really know what you're going to get. So there's there's always a mix. But um, I like to I like to read. A, a lot of different perspectives, you know, get a lot of a lot of different views and and ideas it's it's kind of fun to just jump into something without knowing what to expect 
Yeah, there was a, a short story you mentioned in the book called Mixed Signals by Laurie Ann White and Ken Wharton. Could you talk about reading mm -hmm. that? Yeah, that was that was another one I ran into in one of those magazines. I don't remember if it was Analog or Asimov's. And it was a story about a, a particular idea for the the way the universe is set up that would involve extra dimensions of space and gravitational waves that can pass between them. And it was a, it was a cool story because it was incorporating this new cosmological idea that was really very recent and, um, and that I also encountered in my own research, you know, in, in my academic life. So it was funny to, uh, to hear about this same, the same like physics idea, both in a in a totally, you know, fictional context and also in like my actual research. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And the idea, I guess, is that, you know, there could be parallel worlds, but often in science fiction, it's possible to travel between parallel worlds. But this mm -hmm. was taking a bit more scientific, scientific of an approach that it might just be possible to communicate and only gravity right. would be the gravity would be the only force that would that could make that transition between the two worlds. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And and there's there's a bit of a nod to that idea in uh, the movie Interstellar, where uh somebody's communicating across higher dimensions of space with with gravity but in in that story it was it was very much spelled out and explained um you know in a fully consistent physics way which i thought was very cool mm -hmm. uh, the way i remembered in the book though is it, you, you sort of seem to indicate that that um that sort of the advance of science has kind of moved past that idea or is that right um, yeah, so the the initial so the the idea that's being discussed is the idea that there is a higher dimension of space. So that just means you know if you you there's some direction you could you could potentially move in that's uh, perpendicular to all our directions. So we have three dimensions, you know, forward, backward, up, down, left, right, and there's this possibility that um, there are higher dimensions and that there might be kind of other universes separated from us by these higher dimensions. And so in this story, they were using that idea to talk about um, another world on, you know, on, uh, on the other side of this higher dimensional uh, gap from us. And that idea was, was proposed by, uh, by Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok, who are some physicists, one of whom I, I worked with during my PhD um, as a way to explain the beginning and end of the universe. So the idea is that this other universe that's separated from us by this higher dimensional uh, bulk is could interact with our universe by kind of slamming into it and then separating again and then slamming into it. And every time they, they interact, that's a new Big Bang. These days, they... the. Um, these days, that particular model for a kind of cyclic universe, a bouncing universe, is kind of less uh, less favored. And there's a new idea for something that could give you cycles from, you know, of a big bang and then a new end of the universe and then a new big bang and so on. So that was that was just the idea that was floating around at the time. And it's not that uncommon for these kinds of models to be totally revised. We done that dozens of times when we've looked at how the early universe evolves. So uh, yeah, so that that idea is a little bit out of fashion now, but it's uh, it was something that was very current at the time and a very cool idea back then. Yeah, but you think we could theoretically detect gravity waves from a parallel universe and then we would have to revise our whole schema? Or... Well, well, if we did, if we did detect gravitational waves that weren't connected to any uh any activity we knew about in our universe then yeah it might indicate that there's something separated from us by our dimension but uh it is not entirely clear how easy that would be to test so it's something i i kind of mention in the book i i give a nod to but i don't know that um that we have strong constraints on that right now although you know, we're just at the beginning of being able to detect gravitational waves. So maybe as we get better at that, we could find some really interesting, weird things. 
Yeah. You also, you mentioned the Star Trek, the next generation episode, and I haven't watched the show since yeah. I was a kid, but this episode <laughs> where Dr. Crusher kind of ends up in this bubble universe. And that was probably mm -hmm. the episode that has stuck out the most in my mind over all these years. So I thought it was interesting mm -hmm. that you mentioned that one. Yeah, that one, that one uh, I brought up mostly just for a very, a very useful line that Dr. Mm -hmm. Crusher has in that episode where she's talking about you know, it's very strange things are happening on the ship and people are disappearing and there's the universe seems to be getting smaller around her. And, and she is a doctor, so she knows that she could be hallucinating all this. And so she does, you know, diagnostics on herself and there's nothing wrong. You know, her mind is working perfectly. And so she concludes that if there's nothing wrong with her, there must be something wrong with the universe. And, and that is correct. <laughs> that is what's happening in the, in the episode. And um, I, I use that as a way to introduce the possibility that um, that the reason that we find the the force of gravity to be so weak is not that there's something wrong with gravity per se, but that the universe might be a different shape than we anticipated, might have different numbers of dimensions than we anticipated, and that could be why gravity seems so weak. So it's not something wrong with gravity, it's something wrong with the universe, or specifically just something different about the universe that changes the way we perceive gravity yeah i guess I, I wasn't totally clear so when um when you read say that the um mixed signal story or watch that mm -hmm. star trek the next generation episode how like how old were you or how like deep into science were you when you were experiencing that uh well star trek i guess uh star trek the next generation came out when i was a kid so um i was probably younger than teenaged when i when i saw uh I don't remember exactly when that episode came out, but um, I was pretty young when I saw that. And the mixed signal story would have come out while I was in grad school. So very different sort of epochs. <laughs> um, so watching the um, that, that Next Generation episode and that, that idea of like, wait, there's something wrong with the universe. Is that something that you sort of resonated with you like as a young <laughs> teen? Like there's there's something wrong with the universe. Like I'm going to figure this out or... I just thought it was, I thought it was a great example of, um, you know, deductive reasoning where, you know, you rule out the impossible and the improbable is all that's left. And, you know, uh, Dr. Crusher is such a great scientist, you know, she, she approaches everything in this very logical and clear way. And so this, this line uh, sort of stuck with me as, this is a nice uh, a nice way of arriving at a, a very bizarre conclusion, but through you know a very reasonable set of um, of observations. Because I think that's sort of the story of sort of twentieth century science, right? Is that there's something wrong with the universe? That I mean, um, <laughs> you know, there's this line like the universe is not only stranger than we think, but stranger than we can think. That mm -hmm. you know just how the universe functions doesn't accord with our intuitions of, of anything pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a, a number of examples of that. I mean, for everything from relativity to quantum mechanics, um, the rules that govern the universe on large scales and the universe on extremely small scales are both very much outside of our daily experience and mess with our intuition. So it's uh we we have to we have to kind of accept that things get very very weird um in in different contexts and that's just a property of of physics physics changes at different scales uh, at different energy levels you know there's there are a lot of contexts in which the the assumptions you make about you know daily life and about how things work in a common sense kind of way don't fit uh, in really extreme conditions. Do you get used to that weirdness after a while? Like, or, did you, <laughs> or is it just like, it's still like, it feels just as weird as I ever did. I can do the math, but it just still feels weird to me. Or do you, does that sense of weirdness uh, diminish at all over the decades? Uh, some of it you get used to, you know, you, you get used to the fact that you're not going to have um, the same kind of intuition for every problem, but there are, there are certain things where you also, um, we also do build a new intuition and there are some things that are always going to be strange, you know, that if you stop and think about them in the context of that's actually how the universe works rather than just a bunch of equations on the page, it is still going to have the capacity to blow your mind if you, if you really focus on it. So, you know, it's one of those things, it's a matter of how you think about it and whether or not you 
put yourself in the position of of seeing it as a human observer versus you know just somebody who's writing down the equations. <laughs> In the book, also, you mention um, a number of science fiction authors like Cory Doctorow and um, Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham. Are those people like what kind of interactions have you had with them? Um, I've gotten to know a lot of science fiction authors through social media, actually. So, you know, I've been on Twitter for a while talking about astrophysics and cosmology and so on. And so I've gotten to know a lot of science fiction people just through you know, following them because they have interesting things to say and because I'm a fan of their work. And so uh, those authors are, are some of the ones I've gotten to know over the years and who I've become friends with and, and gotten advice from. Mm -hmm. Is it all pretty much online or have you ever met them in person or gone to science fiction conventions or anything like that? Oh, I've met, um, yeah, I've met all those, all the people you mentioned in person. So um, just through you know, I travel a lot. And so I end up bouncing around the world and being in various places. And, uh, and so I've, I've managed to meet up with with a lot of people sometimes at, at conventions. I mean, I met Alistair Reynolds at a science fiction convention many years ago, but um, oftentimes just kind of, you know, meet up because we're friends, that kind of thing. Yeah. When you know, Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham write The Expanse, novel series mm -hmm. that the TV show is based on. The TV show is, I think, the best science fiction show I've ever seen. I was just curious. Yeah, no, I, on that is. I, I would agree with that. I think it's, um, I think it's great. I think the, the way that they deal with uh, physics in that show is very good. I mean, there are certain things that you have to, certain things that you tweak for, uh, for reasons of the, you know, the things that, that you have, the parts of the story you have to tell, but um generally speaking, the, the physics is great and I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> and um, I also think that the story is extremely well told and the acting is great. And like the, you know, just everything, everything about it. I think it's, it's a very well put together show and, um, and I, I deeply enjoy it. Yeah. You know, I interviewed the showrunner and Rain Shankar and he actually has a PhD mm -hmm. in physics and that mm -hmm. really, uh, yeah. you know, you can tell. Yeah. 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 He's great. Um, and then I guess, you know, and there's not like, well, I guess it, depending on how far into the show you go, but at least in the beginning, there's not like faster than light travel or right. time travel or, or these more sort of out there sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and anything that does break rules is associated with a very specific, uh, phenomenon that, that's not, uh, you know, not just part of the universe, but, but a different, you know, a very different thing. And so, you know, you know, that anything to do with just, you know, normal space travel is not going to break those rules. Yeah. Have you ever thought about writing any science fiction yourself? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm tempted sometimes. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what story I would tell, but you know, it's, it's, I think it's hard to spend all of, all of my kind of leisure time embedded in these kinds of fanciful worlds and not want to be more part of that. Right. So it would be, I think it would be a lot of fun. I, I don't know when I would find the time <laughs> to do it or, um, you know, how, how good I would be at it, but, uh, it's, it's definitely tempting for sure. Yeah. But you've never uh, written anything or any, have any like trunk novels or anything like that? No, no, I've never, I've never written science fiction. I've written a little bit of, of fiction, but of the sort that's like, you know, thinly veiled autobiography, um, <laughs> and, uh, only, you know, only for like a creative writing class or whatever, not, not for publication or anything. Yeah. So how did you go from, or how did you decide to be a science communicator in addition to doing science? I think I just really like talking about science, you know? Um, I mean, I, I'm in academia, I'm in research because I want to discover things. I want to understand things. I want to contribute to our knowledge of the universe, but, um, but I'm also somebody who just gets very excited about new ideas, about uh, ideas that are new to me, even if they're not um, new <laughs> to to the field. And uh, I I find it amazing to think about all of the things that we know about the universe. You know how how far our our knowledge reaches, and how much we're able to discover and to you know sort of have have some interaction with in the universe. I, th I think that's, I think that's astonishing. And I find myself unable to not uh, 
talk about it. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, it's very hard for me to kind of contain my enthusiasm about, about the cosmos. And so that, that just leads naturally to talking about it with, you know, as big an audience as I can find. <laughs> What were sort of the first steps you took in being a science communicator? Were you writing articles for websites or social media or? Yeah, I got started in science writing, I guess. So when I was an undergrad, um, we had a, a kind of science writing course that I took and I adapted a piece from that into a, a science writing contest. And, you know, I submitted it to that and that I got like an honorable mention or something. And then when I was in grad school, I started doing some freelance writing for science magazines, um, like Sky and Telescope and American Scientist. And I really enjoyed that. And so I continued to do freelance science writing whenever I could. And uh, and at some point when I was a postdoc, I discovered that Twitter can be a great place to talk about science and and uh, talk about you know cosmology and, and physics and astronomy. So I started doing that and that went really well, you know, surprisingly well. There are a lot of people on that platform who are very interested in the topic and you know, even though it's it, even though, though it seems like you can only get short bursts of information across because you can embed links and pictures and do threads and so on, you can actually get pretty deep into a topic and even in very short bursts of information you can get across some very cool ideas if you're if you're sort of skilled at it. So I really enjoy that. And I really enjoy that that's a platform that allows you to really interact and, and not just broadcast, but also, you know, answer questions or ask questions or, you know, see what people are actually interested in and where people's knowledge ends and how to, how to best present information. So it's, it's a great platform for that. And then, then of course there's, you know, the fact that you get to meet amazing people who do really cool things uh, hmm. and interact with them and talk to them on online. So it's been great for me. W was your audience growth sort of slow and steady or were there particular things that happened that attracted a lot of attention? Uh, there were a few things that, that really gave me a big jump in my following on, on Twitter. There was, I think the first one was in 2012 when the Higgs boson was discovered uh, I was tweeting about that when the when the discovery was happening and that got me on a few like physicists to follow lists and so that was the first kind of thing that that got me noticed on Twitter and then then various things where you know once in a while a tweet goes viral and then a whole bunch of people see it and a whole bunch of people follow you and the the biggest example of that was um I think it was 20 I think it was 2014 or somewhere around there where um where somebody was complaining about climate change and I, uh, and, you know, tweeted to me about it. And, and I replied to that in a way that, um, I don't know, got a lot of attention. <laughs> so there was this, was this it like, kind of, why, why, why did it get a lot of it? Was it like, um, funny? Well, or? so yeah, yeah. So they, this was somebody I, I'd been tweeting about how climate change is, is, uh, depressing basically. And somebody replied and, you know, said that climate change is a scam and, uh, and said, oh, you should go learn some science. And so I replied that I already went and got a PhD in astrophysics <laughs> and more than that seems like it would be overkill. And somehow that got picked up by a bunch of people and retweeted a whole lot. And then like JK Rowling took a screenshot of it and posted it on her feed. And that just, you know, that blew up my, my Twitter. And I think i my following doubled in in a week. So yeah, I remember was, I remember uh, seeing that at the time. So yeah, I think that's yeah, probably the first time you came onto my radar. Yeah, so I don't remember exactly when that was. Maybe it was 2016, but um, yeah, I think it was 2016. But uh, yeah, that so that was a big jump, um, and you know, so a few things like that happen. Uh, just where you know, if something goes viral, lots of people see it, and then you get more um, followers, and it just kind of snowballs sometimes. Yeah, and so now you're in, you're at North Carolina State University, and you say mm -hmm. that you're involved with the Leadership and Science Cluster Program, and is that it's sort the, of yeah, it's the Leadership in Public Science Cluster. It's a special initiative that NC State does to uh, to encourage sort of connections between science and the public. So it's a group of faculty who all do some kind of publicly engaged science. So either something like citizen science, where you know, you're working with the general public to get the data or like science communication or 
um, looking at how people learn science outside of the classroom or uh, some kind of science research that involves, you know, being out in communities. And for me, it's just that I do my science and then I talk about my science. <laughs> and hmm. uh, and so it's my my connection with public science is, is through the science communication side. Um, but it's a great program because it's official university support for doing science uh, communication or science engagement or public uh, interaction while also doing, you know, academic research. So it's a chance to have both these parts of my career, you know, count toward my advancement in academia, which is, which is rare. You know, most, most universities do not encourage pre-tenure professors to do any kind of substantial public engagement, really. I mean, not to the level where, you know, any kind of allowance is made for it in terms of other responsibilities. Yeah, I, I've heard that about Carl Sagan, that his, um, you know, academic mm. colleagues kind of looked askance at him for doing all the public outreach on science, which seems yeah. sort of counterproductive. But Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that attitude is changing a bit, but the the criteria upon which faculty are judged um, still in most places is just publications in academic journals, uh, grants, and, you know, to some degree teaching. And um, being, you know, writing a book for the general public is not generally considered to be something that would count in your favor in your tenure uh, application. So the fact that that's not the case at NC State is one of the things that made it such an appealing job for me. Yeah. So, so how did the how did you decide to write this book? Like, what was the um, in, the initial idea? Well, I'd been thinking about writing a book for a while, and um, I'd been thinking about like what are the what are the most interesting topics that uh, that I think you know the public is is most interested in. Um, and I noticed that when I gave public talks and talked about the end of the universe, that was something that people got really excited about. And I think part of that is because there are a lot of books um, about the beginning of the universe. People, you know, there are a lot of talks and such about the Big Bang and all that, but people don't hear that much about the end generally. And so I knew that there was some space for that kind of discussion. And I knew that that it's something that, that you know, kind of sparks the imagination. And then when I was thinking through, you know, the different kinds of scenarios I would talk about in the book, I realized that I can also fit a whole lot of really interesting physics and astronomy into the book. Um, and as somebody who's also an educator, you know, that was, that was something that appealed to me a lot. And so, yeah, so I, I put this together and it does contain kind of all the, all the most fun, you know, mind bending <laughs> topics I can think of in cosmology. And, um, and it's, I think a, a fairly, you know, gentle and accessible overview of the field in general, as well as the beginning of the universe, but then going into detail about how we're figuring out the end. So yeah, it seems like a, it was a good topic and the the field wasn't already crowded with, with books about it. Um, and it was something that I thought I could have a lot of fun with. And I, I really did. I really enjoyed writing this book. You say in the acknowledgments, you mentioned a bunch of people like Brian Cox, mm. Jennifer Ouellette, Phil Plait, and Will Wheaton. You say they all gave you book writing advice. Like what sort of advice yeah. did they give you? Oh, I mean, I talked to a lot of authors um, just about like, how do you write a book and how do you deal with uh, publishers and agents and, you know, uh, how do you figure out the title and what happens if you and, and the publisher disagree about the title or like, you know, all those kinds of things. Cause I, I'd, I'd never written a book before. And, and there's a lot in the, you know, in the process, there's a lot um, that if you're, if you're new to it, you know, new to the whole publishing world, you just know nothing about. And so, um, so I, I pestered my friends endlessly <laughs> <laughs> for advice and for insight and um, just, uh, you know, for for their experiences with the publishing process, did that did that process of finding an agent and finding a publisher did that go smoothly or were there any um, any complications? No, that that went very smoothly for me because uh, by the time I was already thinking about writing a book, I had been I'd, I I was already kind of known on the internet and known as a science writer, and so it turns out that that publishers and agents go looking for people who who uh, you know are 
are kind of already in that scene. And especially if you already have a following that you can bring to it, you're especially appealing to publishers and agents. So um, I had been approached for a couple of years by various publishers and agents who wanted to uh, represent me to write a book. So, so I, you know, when it was, when it was, when I was in a position where I could write a book, when I had this faculty job that made it, you know, possible for me to do that. I, I, uh, you know, chose an agent and then um, she helped me get the, the publishing deal with the publisher and it, it all, it all did go very smoothly from there. And I think I had a, um, an unusually smooth experience with that compared to, you know, anybody who is not being chased by, um, by agents and publishers without doing anything, you know, <laughs> um, I think for, for most people, it's a, it's a very different process because, um, most of the time you don't already have that platform. And so uh, you have to kind of convince um, agents and publishers that you're a good investment. Whereas for me, it was, it was kind of, I don't know, I, I, I had a sort of head start on that from social media and science writing. Yeah. And so then I know the, the book just came out, but have you gotten reactions to the book, like reviews and stuff like that or uh, yeah. letters from readers or? Yeah. Yeah. All of the above. Um, I've had a, a, an amazing set of reviews in magazines and newspapers, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Science Magazine, Nature, um, New Scientist, um, you know, Discover, Scientific American, <laughs> like just really, really great, um, really great feedback and reviews in, in all of the kind of major outlets and um, and lots of really great feedback from readers as well. So uh, I've got a, a whole folder full of emails from people saying that they they really enjoyed the book and i've i've uh, not yet had a chance to get back to, <laughs> to everybody because i've been so busy with promotional things but um but yeah it's it's really wonderful and and on twitter you know people will will tag me in their tweets about the book and and it's it's been really gratifying it's been great because you know i i i by the time i got the book deal you know i knew that i was going to be writing a book and um and uh, I, I was, you know, reasonably confident that the publisher would be able to, to get it out there and it would sell okay. But I didn't know if it would be good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'd never written a book before. And so um, being, getting to this point where, you know, I spent, you know, somewhere over two years kind of preparing everything and writing the book and, and uh, editing and all that. And then getting feedback finally from people who are not, my agent and publisher, but, um, but who just come across the book and, and finding that people really like it has been just an amazing experience. And I'm, it's been a huge relief and also very gratifying. Yeah. Well, as we said, so with the book, it's about the end of the universe. And I think, you know, obviously people think, well, like how long could, especially science fiction fans think how long could mm -hmm. human civilization last into the future? Mm -hmm. So sort of like, I don't know if you could say sort of big picture, like what would, how, how close to the end of the universe could we make it? Best case scenario. <laughs> um, how long could we last until, you know, the whole universe destroys itself? You mean like how close to the, yeah. And, and like, what would that yeah. sort of, what would that scenario be? Like we, cause you know, the yeah. sun would expand and fry earth, right? So we would have to right, get right. off earth and then kind of, yeah, that's the first step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, it depends it's good on to which set sort of, of achievable goals. That's the first. Yeah, step. I mean, we've got we've got like a billion years to get off this planet. <laughs> I think we can. You know, that's a long time. We can manage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic on that. Um, but after that, yeah, it depends on on which scenario we're talking about in terms of the end of the universe. So I talk about several in the book, and you know, none of them are none of them are closer than. I don't know, tens of billions of years, um, even at the, at the worst, in the worst case scenario, there's one of the ones I talk about vacuum decay. Technically we can't predict exactly when it would happen, but we can be reasonably confident that it would be an extraordinarily long time from now. So we probably have quite a lot of time. Um, the problem is going to come when the universe expands so much that, uh, galaxies are not interacting anymore, so you're not fueling any new star formation, and the stars that we have are going to be burning out. So, you know, even the longest lived stars um, only burn their their fuel for on order hundreds of billions of years, and that's you know that's a long time. But uh, the universe could potentially last a whole heck of a lot longer than that. So, um, 
we're gonna have we're gonna have some trouble within a hundred billion years just having enough energy to maintain any kind of existence. Um, so it's gonna get more and more difficult. But if this hypothetical future civilization were to move to the center of a galaxy cluster, for example, then there's significantly more time because you can you have more stars around, you know more interactions between galaxies, you can get more stars forming and so on. So it depends on where you go in the universe, uh, exactly how long you're going to have. And then it depends on how you're using the the resources you might come across in terms of energy gradients, right? So uh, I don't know. And then, and then there are also some interesting ideas about how to extend existence farther and farther into the future by using sort of like... Um, hibernation and and so on and and slowing processing and that won't work indefinitely but you can you can get some uh you can get some progress that way uh toward you know a far a far future so you know i, I would give us you know i think if we're if we're smart about it we have a few hundred billion years at least so if uh, say we um, invented some sort of O'Neill colony sort of you know tube floating in space that we could live in and it was powered by um you know, nuclear reactor or antimatter or something. Could mm -hmm. we stay sort of in the within the solar system? How long could we stay in the solar system, and how what would be the deadline for, if if any, for leaving the solar system? Um, I mean, you can hang out in the solar system. The sun will be useless more or less for energy after uh, you know only about five to seven billion years. So, um, if you if you need anything from the sun. Uh, it's not going right. to be very useful. I'm stipulating once you... that we don't need the sun for energy. Yeah. Um, then there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing that's going to come into the solar system and destroy us. Um, the, in in a, in only about four billion years, the Andromeda galaxy will collide with this one, which will make a mess. You know, it'll <laughs> move the orbits of stars around, and there will be some new star formation, and you know, the supermassive black holes will merge, and then that'll you know, that could cause some like jets of high energy radiation and, you know, in some direction, but, but it won't necessarily affect the solar system all that much. It would just, it'll move where we are in the galaxy and, and change our night sky. But um, the, uh, you know, it's not going to hurt us necessarily. Um, even, even the, the amount of star formation that you'll get out of that collision, it'll be enough to set off some new supernovae uh, in, you know, some, Time scale, but it won't necessarily actually hurt us. So, you know, I think we can survive that pretty easily. And then after that, it's just a matter of sort of slow cooling, um, where everything's just kind of fading away for billions and billions and billions of years. So, you know, there's nothing dangerous about hanging out here. Uh, it's just we'll we won't have much of a um, there won't be much in the neighborhood really. <laughs> Uh, so, so you mentioned this idea that Freeman Dyson had of slowing down processing and intermittent mm -hmm. hibernation. Could you I, I, could mm -hmm. you explain how does that help you um, extend in farther into the future? Well, the idea is that you want to use less and less energy over time because you're going to have um, access to less and less energy as the universe is expanding and cooling, and um, and you, you the the whole point of that exercise was to find out if there was a way to slow down your processes as the as the universe is expanding to the extent that you can live technically forever it's just that over time uh you know things get your your each thought gets farther and farther apart right um and that that would work if the universe were expanding linearly meaning that it was not speeding up in its expansion but we know now that the universe is speeding up in its expansion and that does mess up that plan um in a kind of complicated way so so that doesn't work indefinitely but i think it can still it can still kind of buy you some time if you um if you need to just conserve resources over over a, a very long period of time in the cosmos because sort of the thing, the first thing that occurred to me is, wouldn't you want to speed up your mental processes? So, for example, you know, um, upload your mind to the cloud and then go into some sort of a virtual environment where one second seems like a trillion years or something. And then that wouldn't buy you forever, but it would buy you a heck of a long time. Um, oh, you mean to, like subjective? Uh, subjective so you'd time, have yeah. you'd have more subjective time, but they're they're uh, I mean, you would burn out qu more quickly in terms of how long you actually exist in the universe, but yeah, you'd have more subjective time. 
Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know which of those is, uh, is preferable. I think it just <laughs> depends on kind of how you, how you want to live. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's an option. If you, if you, you know, cozy up to a star that hasn't died yet and then ma- manage to speed up your processing so that you have much more subjective time, that's, that's certainly a way to feel like you're, you're living longer for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, is there a reason you would, ne- is there a reason you would need stars for energy at all? Why, why wouldn't you just use, you know, like nuclear reactors or something, assuming, I mean, that you're, assuming that you've uploaded your mind to the cloud and all you really need is electricity or something to keep everything running? Well, you're going to run out of, uh, of nuclear fuel, right? Because the, the half-life of whatever you've got is not going to be billions and billions of years. So, um, there's, and there's only a sort of limited amount of uh, fissionable material, and it will be decaying over time along with the planets that it's part of, right? So nuclear, nuclear decay uh, is a, a limited thing, whereas if you have a, a star, you have a fusion reactor that is going to keep going until it runs out of hydrogen, and there's a lot of hydrogen in the universe. So I think, that, I think you're better off with stars than you are with... Um, with nuclear uh, fit, fission material. Interesting. Yeah, because I guess all of the um, the radioactive decay, mm-hmm. they would have like shot off all of their <laughs> yeah. uh, particles. Yeah, at a certain... Do you know yeah. what... I don't know if you know off the top of your head, like what... Is there a deadline for when that? you'll run out? Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't tried calculating that, but um, I'm sure you can figure it out if you if you work out sort of how much uranium or whatever there is in the Earth and uh, and the half life of it, and just figure out when you would run out. Um, I, but I don't know that number. Yeah. So what do you? Um, I mean, one of the things you talk about in the book that I thought was interesting was um, how does this this idea that even if it's unimaginably far in the future, that at some point mm. everything is going to end. How does yeah. that make you feel? Um, yeah. <laughs> have you since, yeah. since writing the book have have you had any additional uh, insights or anything on that? Um, I mean, I think it's still something that I kind of struggle with. You know, in the in the book, one of the one of the most fun parts of the book was uh, at the end when I'd already written most of the um, most of the content of the book. I was I, I was asking my colleagues for you know their their thoughts about what we're going to learn in the future and what are the interesting big questions and so on. And and one of the other questions that I asked everybody is how does the end of the universe make you feel? And I was just, I was kind of trying to sort of crowdsource this, <laughs> this question of how do you find meaning in a universe that's doomed, right? Like if, if we can't, if we don't last forever, if, if at some point everything that we've ever done or thought or discovered will be erased because the universe is going to die, then you know what? What is the what's the purpose? Like, what's the meaning of life if if it's if it's got an end date and and then it's over and it's all forgotten? Um, and I I don't think I have a final answer on how I feel about that. I think that I think that I have uh, kind of adopted the attitude that we need to find meaning that doesn't rely on some after the fact justification for everything you know it's it's not exactly living in the moment per se but um finding meaning that that doesn't depend on something external or something you know post you know after the fact so um i don't know i i, I wouldn't say that i'm still I, I wouldn't say that i'm fully comfortable with the idea that we're all going to be erased and forgotten <laughs> I think that's still that's still a very troubling notion, even if it is very very far into the future. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we're definitely all going to be forgotten. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's just you know, if say civilization lasts for billions of years or something, how mm-hmm. meaningful is any contribution you make going to be to people? Right, a hundred billion right. years I mean, in the future or something. Well, you know, there's all there's always this kind of butterfly effect thing where you know, even if your contribution is small, it, it contributes in some meaningful way down the road to eventual progress, right? Like if you, even if, if all you do is, you know, just be nice to someone you pass on the street, it's possible that that person will then have a better day and do something cool. And then, you know, and then uh, you'll, you'll have contributed to that in some tiny way. Um, But if, if it's all forgotten eventually, (laughs) then you you can't really say that anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, one sort of my, one of my takes on it reading the book was I, f- I feel like the science is changing so much. I mean, just even in the last decades of what our understanding is that it seems like there's mm-hmm. a non-zero chance that the universe 
won't actually end or that we'll find some, you know, I don't know, you like in a, in, a, in a trillion years or whatever, you know, of doing science, you can imagine all sorts of ways to, um, you know, I don't know, escape to a parallel universe or like create a space where time runs in the opposite direction or like, you know, the, like, and it was making me think of, um, you know, Tolkien had this thing where he said you should never despair. And he was Christian, so he sort of put it in Christian terms. But he says, you mm. know, only, um, like, humans can never be certain of anything. Only God is certain of things. So for you to mm. despair is to sort of, you know, act like you know you, you know things in the way that God knows things when actually you only know things in human terms. And so, mm. you know, I feel like it would be a shame to spend your whole life despairing about the fate of the universe and then, you know, 3,000 well, years I, I from now, somebody sol solves the problem, you know? I mean, I definitely would not suggest despairing about the end of the universe. Uh, I don't I don't think that's a good use of time. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm not super optimistic that we will substantially alter the cosmos um, because, you know, we're just not a very important part of it. You know, I mean, we, we are species that live on one little planet around a star in one galaxy among trillions, right? And even the stuff we're made of, like regular matter, is unimportant to the cosmos, <laughs> to the evolution of the cosmos. I mean, if you add up the stuff in the cosmos, somewhere around 70% of it is dark, is dark energy, which is something that makes the universe expand faster, and we don't really understand it beyond that. And then another 25% or so is dark matter, which is some invisible matter that we don't entirely understand. And then, you know, the stuff we're made of is like 5% of the universe. So we're pretty unimportant to the evolution of the cosmos. And the idea that, that us as some tiny speck in that, um, in that tiny 5% slice could actually substantially alter the course of the evolution of the cosmos seems very outlandish to me. I mean, whether or not there's some way to, I don't know, like transmit information into another region of the cosmos that's outside of our observable universe also seems very outlandish, but I guess slightly less so. Um, but that's not the same as saving the cosmos. <laughs> it's not the same necessarily as saving us. But there are some theories that I talk about in the book that do involve like cyclic cosmologies where you know, the universe would have a new beginning at the end of our observable cosmos ending. And, and that new beginning um, would be a, a new universe. But there are certain theories that involve the possibility that some little bit of information could pass through that transition. And therefore, the new universe might carry some kind of trace of whatever happened in this one. And And so, you know, you might find hope and comfort in that. And some of the people I talked to when writing the book, do find hope and comfort in that. So, you know, that that's certainly not something we can rule out right now. I don't think we can stop the universe from ending, but, you know, the idea that, that something might carry on beyond us that could, in principle, maybe have some some memory, you know, some tiny bit of information from us, that's that's not entirely outlandish. So my understanding is that compared to traveling into the past, which is probably impossible, traveling into the future is relatively straightforward, right? You just sort of put yourself in hibernation and get into a spaceship going really, really fast. And sure. Sort of I mean, you don't even have to hibernate. If you if your spaceship goes fast enough, then you'll experience less time than the people back home um, and you can come back and um, and, you know, be in the future. So. That's, well, but I'm talking, that's reasonably I'm, easy. I'm saying if you wanted to see the, the end of the universe or something, right? Oh, the like, end of the universe. Hmm. <laughs> uh, if you want to, if you want to go check out Millie Way's restaurant. Yeah, no, this one. So, well, so say you're, I don't yeah. know if you could accelerate a ship up to 99% the speed of light or something. I don't know how much sure, subjective sure. time it would take you to get to the end of the universe, but probably oh, a like, lot. like in, like in Tau, uh, Tau Zero, that, that, that classic. Um, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, in principle, if you can, if you can get your, your spacecraft going fast enough and, um, and uh, you know, not not die on the way, then you can see you can check out you know arbitrarily far into the future. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, it, I don't know how interesting it would necessarily be. You know, so in that in that um, that old story, Paul uh, Tau Zero by I think Paul Anderson, they 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 do something like this, and um, and that's that's uh, they they employed a, a big crunch uh, model where the universe collapses on itself and 
Um, and so there's there's a sort of interesting thing that they can reach by going into the far future. Uh, we're probably not going to have a big crunch. It's probably going to be the heat death where the universe just continues to expand and expand and things sort of fade away. So in principle, um, it might not end up being that interesting because you, you get there, you know, and, and all there is is just lots and lots of cold, dark, empty space. Um, but there are other possibilities, right? So in the book, I go through some that are more dramatic, like the big rip where the universe rips itself apart. And yeah, you could go see that, <laughs> but I'm not sure you'd want to. So um, so if super advanced aliens came to you and were like, Katie, mm -hmm. we'll take you on a tour of the evolution of the cosmos, but you can never come back because it's like a one way thing. Right. Would you do that? I think I'd much rather see like a hundred years from now and then a thousand years from now and kind of step forward that way and not go straight to the ending because I don't think the ending is going to be fun. <laughs> but um, but I would I would really love to see how humanity or or whatever follows humanity um, evolves into the future and, and what we discover. I would, you know, I, I would be super interested in skipping forward a few centuries or a few millennia and just, just seeing how things go, um, you know, because I, I find it really frustrating that I don't get to know that, <laughs> you know, that, that, that I'm, I'm, you know, I've got, I don't know, 50 to 80 more years, depending on how, uh, how medical science advances. Right. And, um, and, uh, the, the idea that, um, that I, I, I just, I, I, there's a lot I'm going to miss out on um, that that I don't I don't get to find out uh, what human civilization looks like in 500 years. That's super frustrating to me, right? I want to know. I want to know if we're going to have you know starships and the United Federation of Planets or whatever. Like uh, I'm I'm annoyed that I that I can't go there and see that. I mean, one thing I think about a lot is that there might be a window for us to establish some sort of interplanetary civilization. And so, in, mm. you know, in terms of, you know, society, you know, it, uh, reaches a certain apex and then there's a decline after that. And we've exhausted natural resources and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And that we might, you know, if we miss that window, we might be stuck. You know, humanity might persist on Earth for you know, millions or like billions, whatever years um, with no possibility of ever having missed the opportunity to ever get off of Earth. I hope that's not the case. I mean, that that would that would assume that we'll never figure out fusion power, right? Because because you can't really exhaust um resources enough to make fusion power impossible. Uh unless you unless you just can't make the electricity it takes to run the 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 reactions. Um and and fission, you know, nuclear fission, nuclear power, the way we think of it now, I think is also we're going to have a lot of time to to use that. Um, but I, I think it, I think it would the, be less. Yeah. Sorry, it would be less. I think in in my conception that it became physically impossible in that mm -hmm. you know the uh, depletion of resources led to mm -hmm. collapse of you know governments led to right. climate yeah. change and all this stuff and it just wasn't practically possible. And, and yeah, that that I think is much more likely the the sort of great filter idea of um, of the Fermi paradox where you know, the reason we don't see alien civilizations is because they all destroy themselves before, uh, before they can get out into the universe. Um, that, that seems much more plausible and much more sad <laughs> to me that, that, uh, we're, we're not gonna, you know, maybe we're not going to get out and explore space because, um, because we, we can't manage to, to get along and work together and, um, and, uh, you know, have, have that, that interesting common goal. Um, I mean, I think that's very plausible, and and I hope that that we manage to keep going. I mean, right now it seems like we do have a lot of uh, problems on Earth, uh, really major, substantial problems, but we're still kind of sending up rockets from time to time, and um, that that seems to so far be something we can kind of do in parallel. And it's, I don't think it's harmful to this, you know, state of humanity to to keep doing some of that exploration. And I hope that. I hope that that continues to be the case. I mean, ideally, we fix all our problems, we fix the atmosphere, we become, you know, a paradise on Earth, and <laughs> then we have so much free time that we can just, you know, send things off to the outer planets whenever we feel like it. That would be great. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how achievable that is. You know, that's that's one of the things I would really love to see about the future. Like how how do we manage 
human civilization? How do we manage the social aspects of living together on this on this little rock? And and will we find a way to live in other places or have some people go and live in other places? Um, and uh, and will we have the kinds of opportunities that we need to to really get out there and explore? I don't know. It's funny you mentioned Millie Ways, which is the restaurant at the end of the universe from Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Mm -hmm. And so so people travel into the future to the end of the universe and there's a restaurant and there's a you know, they can yeah. watch the, the universe end and it's sort of there's a cool light show is how mm -hmm. it's described. But you're saying it would mm -hmm. actually be the most boring <laughs> show you <laughs> well, can imagine. I mean th that's the thing. So that 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 book was also written when the big crunch was the idea, you know, the most likely end of universe scenario that that was kind of talked about and the big crunch would be interesting to see, you know, the, the, all the, the expansion of the universe stops and reverses and everything comes crashing back together. And, and it would be kind of a neat light show. I mean, it would also be super lethal for anything that's, that's out there, but um, you know, it, it would be at least, no, uh, at least interesting. Bubble, so they're, they're yeah. Good. So they're cool. Right. So yeah, yeah, it would be, it would be definitely be interesting. Um, but that's, that's one of the least likely scenarios we have for the end of the universe right now. And, and just because, the the big crunch is predicated on the idea that the expansion will stop and turn around and and right now we know that the expansion of the universe is actually speeding up so you know galaxies are getting farther and farther apart from each other faster and faster all the time and it's hard to find a way for that to stop and reverse that you know within the realm of known physics so it's it's not entirely impossible you know there are certain models that that suggest that but um we don't think it's the most likely end of the universe scenario for now. So in the book, you mentioned things like these concepts like Poincaré recurrence and Boltzmann mm -hmm. brains. Mm -hmm. And that just made me curious if you have any uh, opinions on either the simulation hypothesis or quantum immortality. Right. Yeah. Um, so quantum immortality, you're talking about the idea that if there's something that's a, a matter of chance that could kill us, um, then we will we will subjectively live forever because uh every time the universe branches off into a new branch uh the will be on the one that survives Is yeah that, that the there idea? will always be a, some version of you that survives yeah. into the future no matter how improbable it is cuz yeah. there's, there's so many universes yeah 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 that's it's an interesting idea i don't i i do mention it briefly in the book i don't really explore it um it's something i haven't given a whole lot of thought to but it's relevant to the to the idea of vacuum decay which is this this possible ending of the universe where we would we would be destroyed by this uh this sort of bubble of a different kind of space that would form spontaneously somewhere in the universe due to a quantum tunneling event and because a quantum tunneling event is unpredictable and totally random then you know then the, this quantum immortality thing totally applies because any universe where that happens um is kind of you know pruned out and and it's not surprising that it hasn't happened in our universe because you know we we wouldn't be here to observe it if if it had and so there's <laughs> you know that that's a very a very easy way to apply this quantum immortality um kind of idea uh i mean we don't need that based on our understanding of the physics based on our current understanding of vacuum decay um is one such that we think that probably we wouldn't expect that event to have happened yet in this cosmos. We wouldn't expect it for another 10 to the power of a hundred years or something. So it's not, we don't, we don't require that to be still existing in this cosmos. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a totally unsurprising thing. And we don't necessarily expect that any universes have had that happen in our, you know, in that kind of many worlds hypothesis of quantum mechanics uh, context. So, so I don't think you need it necessarily for that although it's an interesting idea and and something that that I've thought about a little bit as for um the the other topic you, you simulation brought simulation hypothesis the simulation hypothesis yeah yeah so that one I've always thought is I'm never sure what the point of it is exactly so what I mean is like we we have measured physics and our universe in lots of different ways. We've done a lot of experiments, we've taken data, we've built hypotheses and models and theories around that data, and we've tested those models and theories and found very good agreement with, with certain um, you know, laws of physics, and everything's reasonably consistent, right? So 
uh, we, you know, the the laws of physics seem to be, you know, reasonable in our universe. We can test them. We can we can uh, discover them. Um, it wouldn't. I don't see how things would be different if those laws of physics were written not by some universal principle, but by uh, some you know conscious action, because we would still be subject to them, right? Um, so, I mean, in the sen- in in the sense, you know, the universe has passed its Turing test, right? Like, it, to all intents and purposes, we live in a universe that is governed by natural law, and there's no there's there's no consequence that we would be able to perceive that would be different if if that natural law were generated by you know some kind of intelligence running a simulation that happens to be perfect simulation you know so i i don't um i don't think it's a useful well, hypothesis well but that that would assume that it's a perfect simulation right and it might be an imperfect simulation so you can imagine like the characters in the sims if they were conscious could maybe infer that they're in a simulation because you're like why every time i go in the pool the ladder just disappears and it's like someone's screwing with me like this doesn't make sense and so the question is just like if you look really deep into the laws of physics would you ever see anything that would make you suspect wait this this doesn't seem like a natural naturally occurring thing it seems constructed somehow i mean if if we did find something like that that would be super interesting but we haven't so like there's no there's nothing actionable, right? There's no, uh, like, I mean, we, we are investigating the laws of physics in every possible way we can come up with. Like we are, we are doing this deep research. We are, uh, looking at, you know, every possible, um, extreme case of our physical theories and trying to extend our theories beyond their, uh, their tested range of validity. Like we are trying to find the edges of our current understanding of the universe because we know that our current understanding of the universe is incomplete, and we're trying to revise and and um, you know advance our our understanding. And so, yeah, I mean, if we find something inconsistent, that'll be super interesting, and we'll we'll revise our theories based on that. But you know, at the moment, there's there's zero evidence for anything um, that that would require a you know a conscious actor and there's there, there are no inconsistencies that we've found that um that rule out natural laws um so it's it's just kind of you know at the moment i think it's it's kind of a moot point um i mean maybe there are some experiments that can be done that are more likely to find those kinds of cracks and and that would be you know that would be interesting and there are there are discussions about that in certain areas of the literature, although not so much in, in theoretical or, you know, observational physics. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think basically if the simulation is good enough, then it doesn't matter. And it seems like if, if the simulation is real, then it's good enough that it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, so I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to, to see if, if there's ever a way you know, ever evidence for something like that. But in the meantime, yeah. you know, we just have to act as though the universe is is uh, internally consistent because it is so far. <laughs> All right, well, just keep an eye out for anything and keep us posted. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, all right, so we're, uh, unfortunately, we're all out of time. So do you have any, okay. just any other final thoughts or other uh, projects you want to let people know about or anything like that? Um, I mean, no, no other projects at the moment. I'm just, um, I'm, uh, you know, trying to trying to get some some of my own research done and um i'm doing a lot of talking about the book but um but you can find me online i'm at uh, at astro katie on twitter and on instagram i'm at astro katie mac and my website is astro katie.com so if you're interested i have a lot of um you know i've been posting a lot of like interviews and video things and so on uh, on all my social media so if you want to read more or watch more about the end of the universe there's a lot of resources there and um you know check out my book yeah yeah absolutely sorry so we've been speaking with katie mack and her new book is called the end of everything astrophysically speaking so katie thank you so much for joining us thanks so much for having me and that was our interview so big thanks again to katie mack for joining us on the show and remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks.
And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Berkeley for sponsoring today's show. Learn more about their new novel, The Mother Code, by Carol Stivers over at prh.com slash themothercode. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.